show you what white privilege is all about. So come on, we going to stove. They got right out on me. Target Corporation, America's retail darling, has survived several scandals because of its cozy relationship with the corporate media apparatus. And so Safe Zone started as a downtown surveillance program, but eventually the Safe Zone grew into a massive citywide surveillance program called Safe Cities that ended up spreading to 25 cities across the U.S. For the past year, Unicorn Riot and the People Power podcast have partnered to bring you the scathing report, 21st Century Jim Crow in the North Star City, detailing Target's deep investments in policing, racialized surveillance, and mass incarceration in Minneapolis. So Minneapolis being this model city, it really, uh, we, we saw innovation in not just surveillance technology, but you know we saw the growth of human surveillance programs through the Downtown 100, which is essentially a criminal registry that is compiled of the top 100 so-called offenders in downtown Minneapolis. None of this would be achieved without denying the voices of black youths and adults in downtown. So you go to the Marriott downtown or, or the city center or Target, all of these people know your record. Do your name, since you're down to laundry, your name goes right to the place and they'll be like, oh, we don't want you here. We recognize the type stuff like that. We used to just go down there just to hang out. We really didn't have nothing to do. Four officers walk up and they approached us and asked us what the fuck was we doing downtown and just kind of got to harassing us. And we said we wasn't doing nothing wrong, so they came and walked up on us and said they'll take us to jail and uh, said they'll Trayvon Martin our little black asses was his exact words and I asked him uh, what do you mean by that you'll kill us he said if that's the way you take it and my friends automatically just said get on the bus just get on the bus they kind of been harassing me ever since then it was a surveillance program that was it was sold to the public as a diversion program, but really it was a pipeline from the streets to prison. But it doesn't stop there. I dove deep into Target's history of racism and was astounded at what I found. represented Juneteenth. Apparently to Target, nothing says Juneteenth like red Kool-Aid. 
But if the red Kool-Aid didn't get your mouth watering, the hot sauce surely will. And according to this Target in Ramsey County, Minnesota, it couldn't be Juneteenth without some good old watermelon to go along with it. I know, because I got some white friends say, come on, bro, show you what white privilege is all about. Come on, we go on the stove. They got right out on me. Look, my white friends walk right out and get that shit to me. I got white folks right now. They get up out their motherfucking bed, walk up in Target, take four or five right out. And that's the truth, bro. That's how I know I feel for the spirit. I don't have to lie. That's the truth, bro, and that's fucked up. You know what that's called? Stereotype. All Despite its long record of racism, Target has managed to come out on top, raking in record profits after George Floyd's murder and the uprising that claimed its East Lake Street store. This is in no small part due to Target's partnership with the press. Target announcing today. Target is raising its starting wages. Thanks for joining us. Minnesota-based Target is making big headlines today. Target shares are up slightly in the pre-market. They are upping their pay game. The company is out with an interesting release here uh, this morning. Target is also expanding access to its benefits. Saying it's lifting its wages to a range of $15 to $24 an hour, depending on, on what markets, depending on certain markets and de depending on what uh, jobs per se. But again, uh, big move here by Target. About 20% of employees will now be newly eligible for comprehensive health care. Target says the new starting wages are part of the company's plan to spend an extra $300 million on its labor force this year. On January 29, 2006, the Washington Post published a story about the Target Safe City partnership with law enforcement, which was reprinted a few days later by the Minneapolis Star Tribune. However, both newspapers failed to disclose the relationship between Target and the author, who was consulting for the multinational retailer at the time which was confirmed by Unicorn Riot. I reached out to the Star Tribune concerning their relationship with Target and the Minneapolis Downtown Improvement District, which Target pioneered, and their lack of critical coverage into its surveillance partnership with police. Now granted, this was almost a year ago. The Star Tribune still has not covered Target in any critical way, specifically regarding its surveillance operations in the downtown 100 that led to mass incarceration of homeless youth. We saw how they used media to really legitimize this, this broken windows theory that ultimately says that if law enforcement focuses on, you know, the most uh, minor infractions such as jaywalking, homelessness, panhandling, spitting on the ground, that could prevent further atrocities from happening. Bloomberg Business Week was one of the only mainstream media outlets to provide critical coverage of Target's safe city partnership with the police, only after Unicorn Riot broke the story. After following my investigation into Target and the Downtown 100, Bloomberg published a cover story with the headline, How Target Got Cozy with the Cops, Turning Black Neighbors into Suspects. They wrote, For decades, Target fostered partnerships with law enforcement unlike those of any other U.S. corporation. Quoting former Mayor R.T. Rybeck, who oversaw this public-private cop collaboration, he said, The biggest difference between then and now is that so many of us come to recognition what we thought was helping had a dramatic negative impact on people of color.
Ryback's claims that they were just trying to help contradicts reality. I recently spoke with an anonymous source by phone who worked on assignment for Target shortly after they launched its Safe City surveillance partnership with police. And my source, he got to meet with CEO at the time, Robert Ulrich, on two occasions. And what he told me was quite remarkable. He said, Ulrich is a staunch racist and everybody within Target's inner circle knows it. He never heard Ulrich use any racial slurs. Instead, he used a lot of euphemisms. But he said he's known for using racial slurs. And there was one comment that my source told me he'll never forget. Ulrich said, I don't just believe in the electric chair. I believe in the electric couch. He said it's one of Ulrich's phrases that he likes to say about people who break the law. He went on to reveal how Ulrich complained about black men hanging outside his downtown store. He confirmed to me that the safe zone surveillance partnership with police was indeed designed to target and remove those black men from downtown Minneapolis. in Minnesota created a petition to demand that Target stop funding the police. That's right, Target is accent pillows in the streets and prison industrial complex funder in the sheets. In 2004, the unholy union between Target and the city of Minneapolis became official when the evil twins launched the safety zone surveillance camera system paid for by Target. The purpose of the cameras? to drive out any undesirables from downtown Minneapolis. Yes, Target is paying for the police to harass predominantly black youth in their streets so you can go into their store and leave with a pair of flats, a dress, and without the milk you actually came for. Bullseye is probably a police dog. When Bullseye is not looking cute in those ads, he's definitely harassing somebody. Recently, I spoke with activist, scholar, and librarian of 25 years, Renoir Gaither. He talked about the major themes he saw after reviewing my findings concerning local media's relationship with Target. First of all, they, they, there's this notion of trying to pitch to the community what is livability crime and livability crime reduction. And, um, and, and so it, it, they, they pitch it as being... This type of crime reduction is important to the growth of commercial enterprise. So that's one thing. And also this growth in profit in the commercial uh, area of downtown Minneapolis, say, is always in competition with other city centers nationally. So that means that uh, it's carrying on this, this idea of capitalism as a set of competitive uh, agents working uh, to to enrich or to gain profit. There's a use of surveillance technologies for social control. Uh, the, the, the young men are watched by street cops that are going around, you know, uh, getting IDs and so forth. Sometimes when I did bad, like steal theft from stores and, you know, things like that. Yeah, and that's my fault. Yeah, like but don't arrest me for walking down the sidewalk. Yeah, you know, and mind my own business. Don't arrest me for that. People that they believed that were making downtown undesirable, and and um, you know it was they they believed these populations were deterring their suburban base, Target's ideal shopping suburban base that they wanted you know to uh, uh, they wanted to see these people down here spending more money. Also, there's an um of background on the downtown 100 as being part of a target corporation-led safe cities program. In other words, it, it detaches these various programs and hides the connection between the safe cities uh, initiative and their various programs, which downtown 100 grew out of. 
And so there's this, there's this way to hide uh, in, a, in a way. Although it does pitch safe cities, it, it kind of often hides or occludes uh, the, its various uh, arms and wings. There's an underlying broken windows theory, which has been debunked, but that's involved and it surfaced in, in one of the articles that I read. That's a part of opportunity, right? Opportunity crimes. So, but, but in the media, oftentimes uh, it's portrayed as only in, in black and brown communities and done by black and brown people. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's, it's, Anyway, it is racist on the face and has been debunked in academics. And that population, this population that that uh, criminal justice, uh, criminal um, yeah, justice and law enforcement are trying to contain and control, uh, are always remain voiceless. That I've seen in any mainstream publication, such as Star Tribune, they're they're very they're loath to give voice voice. To, to that population. I got jumped and robbed um, by these two guys uh, when I was 18 and I fought them back and now I got a third degree assault and if I would've tried to fight it, I could be doing eight, 84 months in prison. So I told them I'd take the probation, which puts me here today. And I'm not, I'm not really with that probation crap. I, I call it modern day slavery, so you know, I don't like it though. It's like, it's a lot of things to probation or the downtown 100 you know, or things just going on in the world today just really don't add up. But they are wildly um, enthusiastic, okay, about giving quantitative numbers of so-called crime reduction in these livable, what they call livable crimes, okay. And uh, so that's what that's the main thing I see. Mm -hmm. And so they're they're placing they're, they're privileging quantitative measures of success and the absent qualitative data which I think is necessary to really get a sense of the success of any program that's specially touted to, to work to, re, to reduce um, social problems. Mm. And also there is a, a lack of attention to uh, inequ social inequities and, uh, and how government and other entities play into reproducing social inequities. So there's this lack of depth into into that into that structure which is really telling you know uh independent news sources on the other hand attempt to get at that you know through the voices of those most affected but the star tribune and, and others major news sources know they they all they get the voices of the powerful the voices of directors ceos these types of people obviously law enforcement officials and so forth where, whereas the people that are most affected by it, they remain silent in their reportage. And that's what I found. There's one article published in February 17, 2011, in, in the Minnesota Post, written by Cynthia Boyd. It's, the subtitle is Minneapolis Private, a Public-Private Partnership Finding Dramatic Success in Reducing Livability Crimes. So it starts off with describing what livability crimes are, petty theft, trans, trans, uh, trespassing, and indecent exposure. And it goes, the next sentence, this is the very first part of the, the article, that's the first sentence. The next sentence, it goes, downtown uh, 100 resulted in um, a reduction in misdemeanor crime among 50 chronic offenders. So they, first of all, the, we have to note that the idea was to, was to was to um, put into this program 100 uh, people of chronic offenders. However, only 50 were, were chosen due to monetary uh, reasons. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to keep that in mind that the program is it's always uh, listed as just about to be removed. There's not enough money, and you know it's always on the brink of losing funding. And if we lose funding, uh, then this crime may come back. Even from the beginning, from the start, it was, well, we wanted to add more people in it, but we had to reduce it because due to funding. Right. <laughs> so that's an interesting thing that helps that helps gin up interest in it, you know, like, oh, you know, an urgency to it. Homelessness is a factor of, of, of being involved in the 
these in these livability crimes. I mean, the, the name itself, livability, is is really right. uh, you know the way I see it is I'm trying to live, <laughs> and these you know offenses are a, a, a part of that. You know, so the community itself, in my opinion, is is really not addressing homelessness uh, as an issue, but it, it, it is re- it is trying to address the symptoms of homelessness mm. see, rather than the problem itself, because that's more challenging. You know, it's, it's easy to pick up offenders, you know, who have been picked up, but not to, to work on the, the, the problem. So, but you don't see that in the media. You know, there's never, there's an urgency to get the program in there, you know, get more people involved to place them in social services, right? And, and also piggybacking on that is to reduce crime. But there is, there's an absence of that, a call to work towards eliminating or alleviating as much as possible homelessness. And we see that, to, I mean, we see that today, not, you know, that's, that was, this was a decade ago, and now it's still, it's, we still see that, you know, encampments, and we see it growing, you know. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's funny how, what, what I'm also seeing is that it's, fun, it's interesting how the media itself perpetuates these, perpetuates a sort of absence or sort of, of uh, just invisibility to the central core problem. It perpetuates it. So it, it acts like, well, this is just a natural thing. You know, homelessness is just natural. Uh, there's, no, there's no connection between the society and its, its systems, of, you know, its, its uh, um, uh, institutions or anything, <laughs> or its economic system, which I'm always talking about. <laughs> There's no, there's no connection between that and the media. I don't come downtown to cause any havoc. That's not my main idea to come downtown to cause any havoc. I really come downtown because I feel safe downtown. I was homeless. Well, actually, I was never homeless. I had my family to go to, but it's just like, I didn't want to be around nobody after my mom passed away, so it's like, I made myself homeless. The way I see it is that, um, the, the idea is that, and it's a liberal idea, which, which Minnesota, but Minneapolis in particular, St. Paul, the Twin Cities, is this so-called liberal community. And the liberal idea is to, you know, that social support, social services, rather than the economic, the underlying economic system, and the conditions that it creates uh, is, 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 is not the culprit, but which needs to be funded. And these somehow will magically, um, the, these band-aids over the symptom will ma- magically uh, get rid of the, <laughs> the underlying cause. Uh, but basically this is done for capitalist or profit gain. That's, that's how I see it. And so there's this nexus of, of liberal uh, support for it from a lot of agencies and organizations uh, because basically they don't see a way to reconstruct their, their society or, or re- reconstruct institutions to, that, w- that really would change the underlying um, economic system that I see creates haves and have-nots. I can never walk a mile in anybody's shoes, but I can understand what they've been through. The main point I want to say about this is that the Star Tribune, along with most other um, uh, uh, media sources, mainstream media, the difference, the primary difference that I think between that and independent sources like yourself is that they do not... uh, give voice to the powerless okay and in downtown the downtown 100 initiative definitely is focusing on um street you know offenders in the street as they return dreadlocks dark skin pants sagging slangy talk whatever they're gonna think you either a gangbanger drug dealer uh, a mugger or something you know they're gonna think something negative about you Instead of holding power accountable for corruption and abuse, critics say the mainstream media in Minneapolis has been more of a lapdog than the watchdog that people need. It also highlights
highlight law enforcement, you know, um, like the Star Tribune. They highlight law enforcement and commercial interests and private ser- uh, uh, social services and, and pitches a, a, a sort of pre- – it presents a synergy between these three entities, which I find it, it, it's a way that naturalizes there's this assumption that, oh, it's better if we link these three uh, groups together, private social services, commercial or capitalist enterprises in the downtown area, and law enforcement. That that, that, will, that linkage will create a synergy that will def- definitely reduce, that will contribute to the growth of, of our enterprise. Um, and this also includes government apparatus, such as, you know, judicial and criminal justice systems. Carl Bernstein, the famous investigative reporter best known for his part in uncovering the Watergate scandal that took down President Nixon, wrote in 1977 about the collusion between corporate media and the state. In an article he penned for the Rolling Stone, Bernstein said, There's ample evidence that America's leading publishers and news executives allowed themselves and their organizations to become handmaidens to the intelligence services. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation American journal? We do have people who submit pieces to other to American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks? This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into in executive session. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to the national news services, AP and UPI? Well, again, I think we're getting into the kind of detail, Mr. Chairman, that I'd prefer to handle in executive session. Today, corporations like Target have their own counterintelligence programs. And more than any other retailer, Target has partnered with police, the FBI, ATF, DEA, the NSA, and even the CIA. But you're not going to find that in the Star Tribune. So there's a whole network, a whole web of interests that are attached. It's never discussed how these work in concert. It's kind of how they work individually. And it's painted as a way of helping these young men um, improve their lives. And what's missing, what's absent, we'll say, is the law enforcement side intervention in their lives. Stereotype. They do it all the time. All right, be easy, man. Get, get a shot of the surveillance. 